Hey there everyone, welcome to the story section of my Final Fantasy VII Remake review. If you're wondering what my thoughts were on the game as a whole, then switch over to part one. This is also an early warning that this will be a spoiler review. There's a lot I want to cover regarding things I loved and things which didn't personally work for me. And with the warning out of the way, let's get into it. So why beat around the bush? Final Fantasy VII Remake is not the remake we thought it would be. It turns out that the game, at least by the ending, is more of a sequel, split, timeline, complementary title to the compilation as a whole. Something we'll go into much more detail later. Long story short, the fate that has been set in stone, that being the original plot of Final Fantasy VII, has been changed. The characters smack a thing and then boom, where's the script? Who touched the script? I'm looking at you, Tiny Tim, you sh of a child. Now we knew this wasn't going to be a one by one remake of the original just by reading some of the interviews before the game was released. Part one was going to be exclusively in Midgar. Of course they'd need to add and change things around in order to make this title a full length experience. I'm not surprised this ending turned out to be so controversial if I'm honest. And in my heart of hearts, I believe Square Enix were expecting this too. This was the definition of a bold move, respected by some and loathed by others. I feel both sides are completely valid. As I've said in part one, be you black, white, or grey, you're all entitled to feel any way you want with this ending. It's divisive for a reason. Now let's move on to the topic at hand, the story itself. In an eerily similar way to my first review, I loved approximately 80% of what I watched. 20% falls very deep into personal taste, but regardless of those feelings, I'm still extremely aroused and frightened to experience the next part of Seven Remake. And before I I move on, I need to make one thing clear. No matter what I say in this video, be it positive or negative, I'm not here to tell you how to feel, going in or coming out. What this game means to you is wholly personal. I just need to share where I'm coming from and what impression the remake left on me. One more thing before I move on to the meat of the video, I understand that there are a lot of theories surrounding the game's story. And whilst I'll be touching on a few which are relevant to my points, or hell, I may throw in some of my own here or there, I definitely won't be making it a hard focus. This episode is long enough as it is without me turning it into a full-blown theorycraft video. And I'm also gonna drop this very early. I want to thank my patrons from the bottom of my heart. Without you guys supporting me, big videos like this would be nigh on impossible nowadays. Link is in the description if you want to help support the boy, I really do appreciate it. I'm excited to finally dig into this, so let's stop wasting time and start serving. We're going to start the ball rolling with characters. Now, before the remake, I've never been that huge on any of Aerith's portrayals, from the original game to the compilations. I never disliked her, but she never clicked with me. The remake's rendition of Aerith is absolutely on point, and I now love her endlessly for it. <laughs> Cranking up the friendly sassiness was such a good idea. She bounces nicely off of Cloud, being a stark contrast to his personality, and it's nice watching him come out of his shell a bit simply by being around her. The added intrigue, which is exclusive to the remake, is her apparent clairvoyance regarding future events of the game, clearly knowing much more than she should know, due to what I'm assuming to be her connection to the planet. And considering what the planet's sending out in this game, I'm not surprised at all that she'd be aware of this. She was the character who would make me laugh consistently just by being herself, and the voice work by the strange rebel was my favourite version of Aerith's voice to date. Whenever Aerith was on screen, I was smiling. On the topic of Aerith, the fact that Tifa and Aerith are now established as fast friends very early on is a welcome change. They were never enemies in the original, god no, but I never felt their relationship as hard as I do in the remake. Mutual bonding over busting my man's balls over here? Love that shit. I'll buy stuff for the bar, decorations, coasters. Can I come? You'd better. Then it's a date. They seem to be very good friends. Cloud is exactly how I wanted him to be. I cannot begin to describe how happy I was seeing him smile, spit banter between his allies, have ranging emotions despite trying his best to keep them locked behind his manufactured mercenary personality. It was just refreshing to see Cloud being a person with complex emotions that shone through during moments of the story. And knowing that this Cloud is here to stay for an unknown amount of parts is very reassuring. I love how they even 
touch on the fact that Cloud at this stage has a five year blank spot. He's a 21 year old man who technically still has the brain of a 16 year old boy. And the writers have confirmed that this is something that they were trying to go for. Like a boy trying to act older than he is, only to freeze up when awkward situations arise. They did a wonderful job at reimagining Cloud, and I'm giddy to see the rest of his story unfold from here. Turning Jesse into the world's biggest Cloud simp was surprisingly charming. In fact, Jesse, much to my surprise, was a game changer in this particular part. Every time I saw her, it was like, All units be advised, we have a uh, one horny, one hostage situation here. Hostage is male, early 20s. The horny is female, mid 20s. Approach with extreme caution. She will try to suck his fingers off. Over. In fact, a segment which I got a lot of enjoyment out of was a brand new addition to Midgar where you spend time with the Avalanche Gang. Giving Jesse dreams of wanting to become a singer at the Gold Saucer and establishing her family was nice. Maybe I felt an attachment because of my life as a theatre kid, or maybe it was the great looking cats outside of her house. How did you make cats look this good, you actual magicians? And all of this made what inevitably happens to her all the more soul shattering. What was initially a sad moment in the original game, which stuck with me, is now given much more intimacy, and was one of the greatest offenders at managing to squeeze a couple of tears out of me. You owe me a pizza. Who else will I have ice cream with? Sorry. Despite really enjoying hanging out with Avalanche, there was one element of this adventure which felt like massive wasted potential, and it's this guy. Well, hello. Hi. Yes, Roche. Massive knobhead who wants to shove his dick into a bike exhaust. Absolute muppet. Love him. You initially meet him as a mini boss during the motorcycle chase, and eventually duel him near the end of this segment. Now, I assumed that he'd come back a couple more times, kind of like Team Rocket with Mechanophilia. But it turns out that this is the last time you see him in part one. You don't even encounter him as an extra boss during the final motorcycle chase, which surprised me a lot. And who knows if he'll be back in part two. I really hope he is, because otherwise he's just an eccentric roadblock who they used as promotional material. And quite frankly, I want to see him expanded upon. On the topic of expanding, Avalanche seems to have applied for an extension since the original game, because they are quite the organization now, coming with different branches and members who are spread throughout the globe. The branch that Barrett and Co are a part of are one of the more radical sects. Which was a little strange considering another group tried to assassinate the fucking president. But you know, go off sis. This is a change that I really didn't mind and felt made sense in the grand scheme of things. In a city as large as Midgar and with the lower class being treated as badly as they are by Shinra, it's no shock to me that there are more people than this small handful of misfits who may want to make a difference. It's an interesting way to hold a potential avalanche based storyline and part two over our heads, considering there are spies littered all over the planet. It's a neat idea, and I hope we get to see more of that in the future. Also, while we're here, Barrett. I like Barrett a lot. Never had a problem with it. Has one of the better later story arcs in the original game. In Remake, I swear to God, whenever the man takes off his sunglasses and interacts with Marlene, scientists around the globe are in a state of panic as there was a giant heat spike which caused the ice caps to melt located directly in my office. Same in regards to Tifa. She's been one of my favourite Final Fantasy characters for the longest time, for a reason. And I'm glad to see that continue into the remake. A kind-hearted, motherly barmaid who can kick your ass and stroke your head at the same time. Is that so much to ask for? God! My nitpicks regarding Tifa are so minor, I considered not including them in the video at all. But after having a pre-established picture of Tifa that I've held in my head for 23 years, something as teeny tiny as her being cradled by Cloud whilst jumping out of a train instead of being the bad bitch who jumps first made me cross my arms like a grumpy preschooler. She doesn't need you, Cloud Jew. Her characterization hits the mark for a hefty majority of the runtime, and it's nice to see a brand new audience being indoctrinated to the Church of Tifa Lockhart. If anything, I would have liked more out of combat playable moments with her, instead of having the one time you control her being designated to fucking monkey bars. I think it's a stretch to segue into this segment by using Tifa, but you know what, I'm gonna do it anyway. There's a chapter later on that didn't settle right with me, and I think it's entirely to do with its placement. The chapter itself is perfectly fine. The gang get trapped by spooky ghosts in the train graveyard and have to escape a warehouse. Shenanigans ensue within. Some light
light-hearted and some which I really loved, like a flashback between Tifa and Marlene, which built a lot of character. But this segment occurs after Wall Market, in the middle of the train graveyard, and before the Sector 7 plate falling. Now, obviously, you had to cross the graveyard in the original game. It was yet another obstacle after your adventure through the sewers. But the length felt perfect, considering the sense of urgency that was felt at the time. This Ghost Children subplot felt like a major pace breaker for me, because the remake's version of the graveyard was fairly long as it was, and the urgency was pretty high during the sewer sections and during the second half of the train graveyard. So adding this subplot in the middle, when Tifa is experiencing a lot of anxiety and wants to get back to Sector 7 as fast as possible, only to see her cling to Cloud as if the anxiety of Sector 7 has momentarily been replaced by jump scare Julian the ghostly hooligan. It left me feeling a little deflated. Would have liked it a lot more if it was optional. A way for you to return and get some more great character interactions and backstory without feeling like yet another obstacle. Hypothetical suggestion, of course. It is what it is and can't be changed. Deal with it, me. And speaking of ghosts, I'm an adult virgin. Ah, the whispers. I'm bringing these boys up now so I can link them into a later point, but the whispers, otherwise known as arbiters of fate, or as I've come to call them, the clock blocks, are definitely one of the more invasive elements to Seven Remake's story, and that is very much intentional. They're here because someone, I'm looking at you, naughty boy, has apparently caused the fate of a planet to lead into some non-canon territory. And the planet doesn't want that. It has a strict itinerary and wants to go out the way it wants to. So it sends out the whispers to make sure that fate remains the same by mopping up any plot inconsistencies or divergences. The only supposed way you can see these whispers is to be in contact with someone like Aerith who can see them naturally. Reno about to get game over? I don't no. think so. Hojo being milliseconds away from spoiling the entirety of Cloud's backstory? Das ist verboten. Wedge survives longer than he needs to? Now, if the whispers were not implemented, then the impact of the ending wouldn't make as much sense as a supposed meta-commentary on remakes as a whole. The most popular theory out there right now, without any official confirmation, is that these are the in-game representation of fans, afraid to see the plot of the game be tinkered with or changed in any way. I feel their reasoning for being here is completely justified. Without them, the entire meta-commentary wouldn't make a lick of sense. But that doesn't mean I have to like them. Yes, whilst I understand why these silly boys are here, I was frequently annoyed whenever they showed up. And to be quite honest with you, after the ending, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the whole point. The developers expressing how frustrating it can be to remake a title when a slight convergence can cause the fan base to run amok. If this was the case, then they definitely succeeded. And I'd say that whilst I was initially interested in seeing where this plot thread would go, the only time they piqued my interest fully was when Barrett gets fucking murdered by Cloud's ex-boyfriend and they bring him back to life, because it isn't his fated time to die. This makes the future of Seven Remake very, very interesting and fills me with that fear and excitement I've been continuing to mention. Here's a gold star, lads, don't waste it. The funny thing is, despite finding them annoying, I've grown to enjoy them in an unintentional way because of how bad they can be at their job sometimes. Like when they try to make Wedge die by dropping a Looney Tunes brick onto his head, they fail to notice a massive underground facility directly underneath them, even though they can move through walls. This was clearly a mistake since they tried to kill him again later, and my headcanon just made this situation funnier than it was. Like they go back to their boss and have to sheepishly explain their fuck up despite being incorporeal beings to which physical masses mean nothing. Don't you have powerful whins at your disposal? Blow him onto the fragile grates and have him plummet to his death or be left unconscious in a den full of monsters. Ah, oh, didn't think of that. This is coming off your paycheck, Clive. Long story short, I am glad that the end ending has hopefully confirmed that we won't ever be seeing them again. They served their purpose, and the meta-commentary that they were there to complement was definitely interesting. Now let's hope we can have a story that continues without any ghostly interruptions. Fuck off, ghost. Now we move on to one of my favorite parts of the entire remake. Wall Market was incredible. A fantastic blend of old and new, where every single element won me over in some way. Allowing characters to have different dresses depending on the actions taken within the game was a great move. And a lot of older segments, such as squatting, getting the drunk father back, etc., have been turned into side quests. They aren't cut out and they're still here for everyone to enjoy. Instead, we have to visit a colorful new cast of characters to get Aerith and Cloud access to see the Dom. You get to hear Cloud bust 
Aston Art, which is pretty cool. <sighs> Andrea, the extravagant owner of the Honey Bee Inn, is just as fabulous as the trailers made him out to be. I could not stop smiling during the dance minigame, where we're given this flashy rhythm game and has more effort put into it than it has any right to have. They clearly wanted this moment to resonate with old and new fans. It screams, we've heard you all want Cloud in a cute dress, and they delivered it with glitter, glam, and charm. And speaking of perfection, I was not expecting the reveal of Hell House, and I legitimately had to get off my chair in surprise. Something I loved during my playthrough of the remake was seeing how some of the more outlandish monster designs were being reinterpreted. Some I naturally thought wouldn't make it in at all, but they actually pulled through with a lot of them, inserting them in as bosses rather than standard enemies, which is not only a nice fan pleaser, but a very good idea. Back to Wall Market. When you finally reach the Don, oh my god, it's fucking vile, and I loved every single second of it. They put an extraordinary amount of detail into animating this guy for our benefit, or detriment, depending on how you look at it. This moment is also a great reimagining of the original Don Corneo scene. Whilst they take the option of who the Don chooses away, it was still pretty satisfying being in control of Tifa and Aerith and wiping the floor with the Don's goons. They crushed it. Pun totally intended. Oh, speaking of characters who made me want to vomit whilst punching my screen like an early 2000s scare game, how can I neglect Hojo. Hojo has been a bit of a joke for me ever since Dirge of Cerberus, I'd argue. What with the I turned myself into a computer Vincent thing. So it's nice to see him back being a superb villain in the remake. His introductory scene with Aerith shocked me as he talks with an almost orgasmic amount of pleasure about how they collected her dead mother off the street and separated her piece by piece, skin from bone, and even offers to show her samples in petri dishes. This man is a monster, and they did an amazing job at reminding us that. One moment in particular which they toned down in the remake is the infamous attempted breeding scene. I can't fault them for the way they did this. If they decided to stick with the original, I wouldn't be alarmed to find out that it screwed the pooch on the overall rating. Literally! The suggestion he brings up instead is still monstrous and lets us know that people are not people to Hojo, merely specimens that further his scientific goals. And it works. I would start with candidates from Soldier. These would, of course, include S and G types. Oh, there he is, ladies and gentlemen. There's his extended cameo. Speaking of monsters, I'd now like to talk about a certain young man who I kept out of the footage of part one for a very good reason. And that's the president of the Eldritch Milf Association, Sephiroth. Or Sephi, as he was more commonly known in 2004. Sephiroth is quite the spotlight stealer in Seven Remake. Whenever he's on screen, he commands attention from you. It's as if the evil sister of one of a 4 k models pushed her off stage and told all of these ugly bitches to watch and learn. The best thing I can say about Sephiroth's involvement in the game is the interesting future that he's painting for the series. As many people have theorized, the Sephiroth in 7 Remake might not be the Sephiroth from Final Fantasy 7, or at least, some of them aren't. Yes, you heard me correctly. After doing my homework reading Ai Taiki Mochi's fan translation for the Final Fantasy VII Ultimania, they've confirmed all of the Sephiroths that appear in the game. One being a vision, the other being a flashback, one is the possession of the Sephiroth clones, and the final is unknown. I'll touch on the latter when I discuss the ending. For now, I'm going to discuss Sephiroth as a whole instead of breaking down potential theories on each individual. His goals in part one seem to boil down to changing destiny, a goal which the main party, ironically, would end up sharing. And throughout the game, Cloud will have some very nasty headaches where Sephiroth will pop out of a wheelie bin to smug chuckle at the poor boy whilst dropping a lot of knowledge about events that he should not know at this stage. So even though I'm interested in what Sephiroth will bring to the table in the future, future, cause I'm a sucker for a good mystery, there's still something I missed about him up until the very last moment you see him in the game. Sephiroth no longer unnerves me. Now this is yet again where it gets personal, because let's be real, not everyone was a broken child like yours truly who found God's gift to my trousers scary. But good lord did they do an amazing job at creating suspense and fear in the original by keeping him in the shadows. To give those of you who haven't played the game a rough idea, you see a full body reveal of Sephiroth very early. I'm talking directly after the bombing mission early. And considering the possibility that this Sephiroth is Alternaroth, or at least some of them are, 
now? I think it's valid to sow the seeds of mystery in order to make us think. However, call this man a farmer because he sowed quite the field. Sephiroth likes to show up a lot. Comparatively to the original, of course, he shows up a bunch and this is an intentional move by the devs. Walk outside, Sephiroth. Get into bed, Sephiroth. Walk down to 7-Eleven to pick up a can of beans and there's Sephiroth smugly holding the last can. Got your beans, cloud. Before I begin properly talking about this, I'd like to acknowledge this explanation from the devs regarding why Sephiroth is presented the way he is in the remake. The way we handled Sephiroth in the original Final Fantasy VII was to hide him. Hold him back, Katase said in the interview. You may not know this, but I was inspired by the movie Jaws, which took a similar approach of teasing this powerful presence, but not fully showing you the shark until later in the story. We wanted to build him up as this big, powerful character in people's minds. By only referring to him indirectly, it created this feeling of fear and oppression. So when he makes his first appearance, it's a big deal. When it came to remake, Kitase said, the buildup wasn't possible because most folks <clears throat> would already know of Sephiroth and his role in the overarching narrative. So instead of holding off on showing him until further into the game, which since remake is being released in parts likely would have been in a sequel, they introduce him much earlier. This is understandable for the most part. The idea that because this game is no longer singular, it would be necessary to showcase the main villain, especially with how relevant he is to the ending you're setting up in part 1. However, I'm going to focus on this particular segment, the Jaws inspiration. This is what I adored about Sephiroth in the original, and it's what would scare me about him. Sephiroth was always an enigma during Midgar. You'd hear whispers about him, dangerous whispers, but the man's identity was hidden from us until you reach a flashback all the way in calm. This, for the uninitiated, is beyond Midgar. The only time you acknowledge Sephiroth's presence fully is in the single best scene during all of the original Midgar section, and that's the Genova incident from within the Shinra building. The gang are imprisoned and awaken to find that something isn't right. The doors to their cells are unlocked, and the bodies of Shinra employees litter the blood-soaked halls. The blood would lead us to our big reveal. Sephiroth has murdered President Shinra, and the only part of the murderer that we see is his iconic weapon sticking out of the victim's back. The first proper look into Sephiroth is the aftermath of his actions. It's cold, unforgiving, and combined with the blood-soaked floors and fantastic musical accompaniment, was pretty damn scary. The Jaws effect. We know it's a shark, but the director still hid it from us. We see the odd glimpse, but the build-up to this is blood, screaming, and the bodies it leaves in its wake. Now, let's think about a hypothetical Jaws reboot. Everybody knows Jaws. He's a big fucking fish with the voice of an angel. Because people know who Jaws is, would the initial impact of Jaws' first victim be as scary if this was the first scene? I'd argue that just because the audience know who Sephiroth is, it's still better to keep him in the shadows to build up that suspense. You can still build him up as this alternative Sephiroth because a majority of the time, the clues he drops lay within his dialogue. I am not implying that I'd want the scenes with Sephiroth to be removed from the game. I actually like what he has to say and the mysteries are genuinely intriguing. Have Sephiroth be a ghostly voice from within Cloud's head. His shark attacks, so to speak, would be Cloud's headaches. Let us see the odd flash of his eyes or smile when the reunion boys stumble into the scene instead of dan 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 dan. Then, when we're in the Shinra building, we see our first actual glimpse of Sephiroth as he walks past Palmer. A scene I unironically loved because of how they hid him. You walk the trail of blood, go through the scuffle with President Shinra, and boom, drop that full body reveal. It would reach smash announcement levels of hype for me, and after that, you can go crazy with how much he's shown on screen. But instead, due to the oversaturation of Sephiroth, a phrase I never once thought I'd say, the reveal didn't shock me. It was instead a fairly neutral internal reaction. And that is a shame. 
because I miss being scared of the sheer idea of Sephiroth. Would have been nice to have a villain completely shrouded in mystery up to a point, and a villain that was as in your face as the Shinra Corporation. It would make for a nice contrast. Instead of being shrouded in mystery, he's a mystery delivery man. Instead of leaving ominous letters through your mailbox, leaving you to ponder who did this, he's standing at your door, requesting your signature. The funny thing is, according to the Ultimania, they were initially going down a route that would have been much closer if not exactly like the version of events that I just discussed. How dare they not cater to me specifically and instead cater towards people with different tastes to mine. You have a lot of nerve. Also, for new players who know barely anything about Sephiroth and who may have avoided learning about him through cultural osmosis, and they do exist, who is Sephiroth? Why is this man so important? Might it have been an idea to push the calm flashback into Midgar so new players have more understanding of this famous villain? But I have a feeling they're saving the calm flashback for a grand intro into the second part of the game, maybe with a playable Sephiroth to see it from his viewpoint, which would definitely be a unique experience. This will age the video terribly if it doesn't happen, but still, it would be cool. I still love Sephiroth as a villain and would twiddle my hair as he spits in my <sighs> mouth, but I wish I wish he'd stop being so bloody smug about it. Like he knows how famous he is, the cheeky bastard. If anything, I'm at least interested in what he has in store for us in the future, now that his plans are untethered by the weight of destiny. I guess only time will tell. Also, before moving on to another positive, I need to get this one out of the way. The trail of blood being changed from this to purple Kool-Aid and no dead Shinra employees in sight was kind of disappointing. I understand that it's to get around the rating system, but it was one of the scenes I was most excited to see and it didn't live up to the weighty expectations that I was building up for myself. I guess since you can't even show blood when Barrett has his guts reorganized by the Mazamune, then leaving Sephiroth to do the interior decorating may not be the wisest choice. Can't have everything, I guess. But it's not all doom and gloom. One element which revolves around Sephiroth I was very happy to see established in a clearer way, and that was the reunion theory. I can't speak for everyone, but as a kid, I found the whole reunion aspect of Seven a little confusing. Hojo injects a bunch of Nibelheim survivors with Genova cells to see if parts of Genova that have been separated from the main body will attempt to rejoin it. Turns out that Cloud was also one of these people, and is puppeteered into handing the Black Materia to Sephiroth, reviving him from his confinement. It made a lot of sense to me to establish this entire storyline earlier than it was in the original, giving them a very clear look instead of initially starting off as bloke, and giving us a bunch of nice setup and anticipation for new players. I liked it a lot and feel like it was a good move by the writing staff. Another favourite part of the remake for me was in the Shinra building. The infiltration was a little silly. <laughs> just, just look up, look up! Do your helmets have no peripheral vision whatsoever? Does Dozens of Wutai soldiers infiltrating Midgar by being on a slightly elevated surface. See, in the original, I was never a massive fan of a Shinra building up until you reach Hojo. It's a bit of a chore, even if you're using a guide. The puzzles never grabbed me, and yeah, I wanted this bit to be over so I could get to the Hojo part. This is no longer the case in the remake. They turn this into a great parody of Shinra, being taken on a tour by a happy-go-lucky robotic guide, showing you all of Shinra's accomplishments, which which have been polished by a thick coat of lies and over-exaggeration. I adore how a majority of the pre-recorded holograms you speak to simply don't give a shit. Why should they care what the general public think? If they disagree, they'll have a hard time finding a new job. So who cares? What? What? Uh, read this? This paper right here? Uh, give me a moment. Oh, yeah, not at this particular moment, because I'm filming this rubbish instead. They really do save the best till last, though. An amazing swan song. As we get to see something which I've been curious about ever since the original Seven. Cetra Civilization. In a VR room, they're whizzed around the ancient society, watching them form materia out of a life stream and communing with the planet. Looking like a society which came straight out of the earlier high fantasy games of the series. With airships and nomadic culture, and it's just brought to this great crescendo where the Shinra propaganda reaches its peak. The voiceover claiming that Shinra are simply the modern equivalent of the Cetra, using the life stream in ways which can benefit the world, and how they wonder if they're looking down on them now, waiting for all of modern society to reach them in their promised land. 
I love this so much. Having it so we see Cetra civilization behind the veil of corporate propaganda was inspired. It adds a whole other layer of unintentional comedy to the scene, and even hatred towards Shinra, being made to feel nice and comfortable whilst you're listening to their lies after witnessing the atrocities that they themselves have caused. In fact, Shinra as a whole were amazing. As villains, they've always been very in your face with their evil. They don't need to keep them in the shadows like my hypothetical Sephiroth. They're so common comically over the top sometimes, but it reminded me of Robocop with its representation of capitalism gone wild. Speaking of capitalism... The ultimate flavor experience. What is it with you guys and noodles? Having Scarlet getting hot and steamy over the creation of new weapons and leaving scientists to die as her footrest scurries behind her. President Shinra's gun being made out of... Goal. The only redeeming part of Shinra being Reeve. And God bless Reeve. I'm so happy they put more focus on him this time. He's just as much of a main character as everyone else. It's just that he's this for most of the game. So hopefully he'll have much more of a presence going forward. It was always something I respected Dirge of Cerberus over. <laughs> Are you serious? The clear distinction that yes, while Kate was a protagonist, he has always been Reeve. I have the damage assessment for Sector 7, and I'm afraid the figures are catastrophic. Spare us the doom and gloom. Well, sir, I've also drafted a that reconstruction plan needed. for- Not only have Shinra been the standout villain for me in 7 Remake, they've also been cramming something into your line of sight so much I feel like one of the general public of Midgar, and I swear to god, I loved it. Security is looking pretty tight. Could be for Avalanche. Or maybe even Wu Tai. Yes, something that Shinra are pushing harder than anything else is the Wu Tai War. Despite the fact that it ended approximately seven years ago during the events of Crisis Core, the propaganda regarding Wu Tai is an element of Seven Remake that I'll forever praise as an overwhelming positive. A lot of stuff regarding the Wu Tai War are background things, or your characters bringing it up in passing conversation. But it's wonderful to see the lingering after effects of that war ring out around Midgar, making it so present. President Shinra is using the public sphere of another war with Wu Tai breaking out and painting Avalanche as if they're collaborators with the nation, only pushing the public's hatred of Avalanche even more with his propaganda. If anything, it makes returning to Wu Tai in a future installment something I'm dying to experience, and I'm sure it will give Yuffie a lot more to do and say when we get round to obtaining her as a playable character. <laughs> Now, before I move on, how can I avoid talking about a character that the compilation all but forgot? Red 13. I'm happy to announce that he's back, and he's going to make sure you remember him this time. Red has always been a wonderful member of the cast, and it would always bum me out in subsequent compilation releases when he was pushed into the background. There are still those with the Ligma. <laughs> So, to see him here and knowing he can't be ignored is kind of great. Why did you think I left him all the way at the end? Bet you thought I forgot about him, huh? Now, I hear all of you still disappointed that you can't control Red during the events of part one. I get it, but considering how you get him with approximately two to three hours to spare, I can see why they decided to save his gameplay for part two. But to compensate, they gave him a bunch of really fun, memorable scenes to make up for it. Avalanche! Local florist! Lab rat dog. It's as if they knew there would be backlash for not being able to play as our favorite Digimon, and so they made sure to give him a lot of things to do within the short amount of time he's available. Also, seriously, what sorcery is going on over at Square Enix when it comes to animal models? No, I'm not going to drop this. Have you seen the cats in this game? It's actually unreal, engine. Ho <laughs> ho! Good kitty. The final thing I'd like to talk about before we dive into the ending is Final Fantasy VII, the compilation. Final Fantasy VII has grown over the years, and I think it's safe to say that what Seven is to me may be entirely different for you. You may have started off watching Advent Children, playing Crisis Core, or you could be like one of my extremely good friends who started off with Absolute Kino. Really gotta call me out like this, huh? But here's my point. Final Fantasy Seven is no longer just this. It's this. Seven has a legacy now. It has a future. It has a past. And so, with the remake, they had an opportunity. And they took it. 
the integration of the compilation. No longer are these titles simply stitched onto the end of Seven's pre-established story. They are now woven into the original narrative, allowing for all of this to be thrown into a boiling pot. The end result is the remake. Now, obviously, a lot of the inclusions serve as nothing more than minor pieces of world building, characters, or cheeky nods. And me bringing up the integration is not a defense of the quality of the overall compilation in the slightest. But having these moments here does make the world of Seven feel a little bigger for me, when I'm asked to indirectly acknowledge the fact that there's a larger story out there. As someone who holds a mixed reception to the compilation while still enjoying them for the most part, one of them being a notorious guilty, guilty pleasure of mine, it was funny to see myself reacting in such an excited way whenever the compilation was referenced. The experiments that are being cooked up underneath the slums initially being coded as deep ground in the data mine, or referencing Kunsel of all people, a character who was close friends with Zack despite the player never actually seeing his face. And I'm not sure how many of you may be unaware of this, but two new characters, Leslie and Kyrie, they're characters from Final Fantasy VII novels, or to be more specific, The Kids Are All Right, a Turk side story. So not only do we get compilation editions, we're getting everything. The books, the games, the movies, anything which is a part of Seven's vast library of content is finding its way into this game. If anything, I hope this allows us to tie together some loose ends. Cisne's arc being left in a permanent to be continued limbo at the climax of Crisis Core is an example that I personally love to see concluded. It feels like the perfect time to do so as well. One big reason and why I was so mixed on a lot of the compilation is because of how stitched together they felt to the original narrative. And now, they have the opportunity to blend things more naturally. And quite frankly, it's one of the reasons why I'm so excited to see where this will go. And on that note, I do believe it's time to finally start talking about part of the game that has definitely caused a bit of a stir. I am, of course, talking about Tifa's Ab. Now, I'm gonna be as candid as possible. When I first beat Seven Remake, the ending terrified me to the point where it was making me angry. The need to know what they were planning pushed me to increasing levels of frustration. What are they planning turned into what have they done. So I discussed it with friends. I discussed it to myself to the point where neighbors are probably listening through the walls thinking I've fallen into a lockdown induced psychosis. And now it's been more than a month later and I've had time to put that fear to rest and rationally think about this. I've replayed the ending to see if my thoughts have changed. And the big question is, what do I think now? Well, I'm still thinking about the ending, and I think that says a lot. If you're waiting for a complete 180, that won't happen. I'm still stuck in the middle with a lot of elements because I simply don't know where things will go in part two. And sadly, that's where a lot of my thoughts lie and will continue to remain, in this limbo state. I can't really be angry at some of these changes because I don't know how they're gonna conclude. They could potentially pull off one of the most satisfying multi-part series I've ever played, but until then, I'm gonna be thinking about it. The ending starts off when the original Midgar section ends. The gang get to the end of the road and Sephiroth is waiting there for them. The whispers which had previously been swarming around the Shinra building start to coalesce around the party, giving them a vision that none of them should be having the right to see now. This leads to Sephiroth slicing through the whispers, creating a portal to Destiny's crossroads, a place where Destiny can be changed, so long as they can defeat it. If Aerith's speech before entering is in reference to 7R's meta-commentary, then it's probably one of my favorite speeches in the entire game. Regardless if it is or isn't, it's still a really great moment. The idea that no one knows what's beyond this point, implying that not a soul, not even the writers, know where this will lead. And that, in of itself, is boundless, terrifying freedom. Gotta wonder the talks that the devs had behind the scenes regarding this whole thing whilst massaging their mammoth-sized testicles. The actual fight itself boils down to a fun duel between you and three whispers named Rubrum, Crocchio, and Viridi, all being spawned by a colossal entity known as the Whisper Harbinger. These three whispers, it would turn out, are a trio of very sneaky references. Thanks to some eagle-eyed fans and the Ultimania confirming it, these could be the actual Kadaj, Loz, and Yazoo from Advent 
children, Krokyo having a technique called Velvet Nightmare in the Japanese translation, aka one of the guns that Yazoo wields. Yet again, this is a nice way to bring all elements of a compilation into one single title, even if they serve as nothing more than cute little nods to the fans. I like it, especially since they lack the ability to speak so you don't have to listen to them whinge every 10 minutes. <laughs> A nitpick I had comes with a singular cutscene that plays throughout this fight. As parts of a harbinger fall off, the party will be brain blasted by beams of what will come to pass if they fail. Those being scenes from Advent Children, which show off the future of the original seven. Most of these work well and serve as nice fan pleasers for those out there who've watched the movie. But the only one I found myself raising an eyebrow at is the very first one. Any one of you who's watched Advent Children will know what this scene is. In a flashy reimagining of the very final moments of Final Fantasy VII. Red and his puppies overlook the ruins of Midgar, humanity seemingly being wiped out 500 years after the meteor and holy incident. It's a powerful scene. However, they cut before we really get to see that particular moment. So instead, it's just a short scene of Red going for a jog. The party's reaction after the fact makes it seem like Red gallivanting with his children is somehow a negative thing. How would this scene play out for people who've never seen Advent Children? That's Chewbacca. <laughs> Other than this tiny nitpick, the fight itself is a grandiose spectacle, and this particular shot of Midgar is absolutely gorgeous. I think my biggest takeaway from this fight is the confirmation that, love it or hate it, the writers are doing their homework. Not only on Seven, but on all of the compilation. Who else would pick up on the fact that Velvet Nightmare is the name of Yazoo's gun? Unless they not only sat down and watched Advent Children, but dove into other texts regarding the movie itself, picking up on all of the tiny details regarding weapon names, etc. This makes me hopeful in many ways. I think this is a clear display of passion, and I can't wait to pick up on any other tiny inclusions like this within the next parts. If anything, I'd argue that my suspension of disbelief was being tested heavily during this fight, considering the power gap that Cloud and Co were experiencing, going from struggling with an incredibly sexy CEO with a magic gun to fighting Destiny Satan. It was quite a sudden leap in power, and knowing that they'll probably be struggling with the Midgar Zolem in part two, I've got a question how the overgrown serpent has the audacity to stand before the actual murderers of destiny itself. How can we make this more of a threat? Midgar Zolem with a gun. Joking aside, this is, of course, minor, but I do wonder how part two is gonna cook up a final boss that will even compare to the scope of part one's finale. I do bring up the question if they potentially blew their load a little early, but as mentioned before, I have no idea what's in store for the future, so for now, my reservations are being put on hold. Bring it on, bitch. Once the Harbinger is defeated, we're brought into a peaceful white void a place that even Aerith is unaware of. This peace is short-lived, however. Sephiroth appears, seemingly absorbing the Whispers in their weakened state, now able to control them to an extent. I'll be honest yet again. When I first got round to this fight, I found myself rolling my eyes. Considering all I've said about Sephiroth before in this video, the thought that came screaming into my head was they just couldn't help themselves. Of course they'd make the final boss Sephiroth. Of course they'd just end up using One Winged Angel. However, upon further reflection and a second playthrough, I'm now much more comfortable with this fight, solely because of what I feel is becoming my mantra at this stage. I don't know what will happen next. No one does. There's a chance, no matter how slim, that Sephiroth won't be the final boss. Are you serious? Or at least, you'll no longer be able to fight him in his human form. One Winged Angel could get a complete overhaul, still keeping the same beats, but overall feeling much different than the original. This way, fans could still get the Sephiroth fight they wanted, original theme and all. Of course, this is all baseless speculation, but until I see how all of this multi-part series concludes, I can't in good faith say that I hate or love the fact that we fight Sephiroth so early into the remake series. It's a fantastic fight, all things considered. And you know what? Having Aerith say this during the fight felt like a cathartic way to end a 23-year-old grudge. It's tough. Yeah, so what? Screw him. 
Cloud is the one to land the finishing blow, sending a wave of whispers to scatter out of his body. My pet theory is that Sephiroth coaxed them into fighting him in order to deal the finishing blow on the Arbiters of Fate. But regardless, the whispers are now, at least to our knowledge, no more. Cloud is sent hurtling through time and space, giving us a scene reminiscent of the original ending of Seven, where we fight Sephiroth one on one. This Sephiroth is the aforementioned unknown element, who, according to the translation of the Ultimania, the party have not encountered before. This scene, upon my replay, is the scene that saved Sephiroth for me and filled me with a want to know more. Cloud and Sephiroth are looking out onto the edge of creation, and even without looking into the Ultimania for confirmation, something seemed off about Sephiroth here. He's almost sane. He's talking to Cloud like a human being, and even shows a little shred of disappointment when Cloud refuses his offer at changing destiny with him. During this fight, Sephiroth barely lands any blows on Cloud at all, only taking a few easy swipes and defending a lot of the techniques that Cloud throws his way. Finally, after disarming him, he drops this line. Seven seconds till the end. Time enough for you, perhaps. But what will you do with it? Let's see. What does that mean, Sephiroth? Release the Cody Ko and Noel Miller reactions. Interest peaked up yet again when, according to Japanese translators, Sephiroth addresses himself here as Ore. This is worth noting since he usually addresses himself as Watashi post Nibelheim. What I think this is implying is that this Sephiroth might be from a pre Nibelheim point in the story. Quotation marks bombarding the word might there. As to whether he's good or evil, that's up to the future to decide, and I'm itching to see how it plays out. I really did enjoy this. It gets the part of me that enjoys speculation amped up. Could those seven seconds be the amount of time it takes to perform Omni Slash? Could it be the amount of time it takes Sephiroth to stab Aerith? These are all theories I've seen, and thing is, all of them could be plausible. I'd like to imagine it's something completely new instead of baiting us with other pivotal moments within Seven, which would definitely surprise me a lot more. Until part two, all we can do is speculate, and I do hope they pull off a twist that shocks us all to our cause. With Sephiroth held back and the Whispers defeated, something happens. And this is definitely part of the ending that terrified me the most and led to my anger. By incorporating Stamp, a cartoon dog that Shinra used for propaganda, they show us that the Zack they showed off before we entered Destiny's Crossroads is actually from a different timeline due to the change in its breed. And because the Whispers are defeated, meaning that Destiny is no longer set in stone, this means that Zack, at least in this timeline, survived the final stand. He is alive to take Cloud to Midgar. Cloud will no longer pick up on parts of Zack's personality. Not only that, but it appears other characters are also alive and well. One of them being Biggs, and the second is a little more subtle, but Biggs never had a plated glove in the game. That belongs to Jesse. It wouldn't be surprising to find out that Wedge survived his off-camera fall as well. The terror came from a very real and, I hope, understandable place. Seeing these characters alive made me so uncomfortable because of the impact their deaths held on me for over 23 years. Even if Zack is from another timeline, seeing him alive felt unnatural. It didn't feel right. It felt like the tears I shed for him during his final stand were inconsequential, and that angered me. Seven's original theme was always surrounding death. Death in Seven was cold. It happened out of nowhere. Biggs, Wedge, and Jesse dying. What did that accomplish? They didn't get to stop anything. Their deaths just being another three figures in the Sector 7 disaster. It was horrible. My initial reaction upon seeing this was believing that the original concept of death wasn't being upheld. But after a little more reflection and a bit of a deep dive on Seven's development, Tetsuya Nomura was the man who orchestrated Aerith's death. He wanted this death to feel as real as possible instead of feeling like something that came out of a movie. Then I remembered the Barrett scene that occurred during during the Shinra building. He was brought back to life by the Whispers. It wasn't his time to die. But now, the Whispers are no longer here. Every single character has a brand new death flag looming over their head. Anything at this point is possible. For all we know, Biggs, Wedge, and Jesse could die again later down the line. Tifa could be the next in line to go, or who knows? 
potentially even cloud. This made me hopeful that in the future, character deaths will still hold the same weight as the original, and that this ending simply resets everyone and gives them an extra life. I know it's kind of fucked up, but the concept of characters I love dying makes me hopeful, but <laughs> it's lockdown, baby. Because I have no idea where this can go, I am completely in the dark in regards to what twists they could throw at us, and so I'm willing to give these guys an optimistic chance. I'm 100% willing to see where this will take us. They've already proven to me that they're able to make the cast of Seven more lovable than they've been in years. They've proven to me that they're able to pour a lot of research into scouring through the compilation for fun ways to incorporate it into their new story. And if anything, the mysteries they've set up have me hooked. Yes, I'm still side-eyeing Zack right now. They wouldn't show him alive for no reason whatsoever, and I feel the way they handle that in the future could have me feeling either relieved or clutching either side of my head in blinding agony. On your left. Me? I won't lie to you all and say that the fear isn't there anymore. Absolutely not. It's still bubbling away inside of me, but quite frankly, I still firmly believe that the dev team expected this, and they'll want to deliver something that puts that fear to bed. A concern I have is in regards to the way this new content is delivered, the things which deviate from the original Seven story, where original segments of Seven feel more like an obligation for the fans, scattering new content here or there only to cram in a huge majority of original content right at the very end as a shocking twist like the finale of Part 1. Considering what Part 1 has effectively done, I'd say they no longer have to be forced to do this. I don't want to see each part feeling reminiscent of the Disney and original content divide from the Kingdom Hearts franchise, Disney levels feeling like an obligation and the final world having a lot of the bigger revelations. I say don't let this incredibly bold ending go to waste. Hit the same beats but keep us on our toes, keep us guessing with new moments, twists and turns. Have the compilation's involvement sway elements of the story in what I hope to be a satisfying way. Just try not to make a game which feels, narratively at least, significantly weaker than the original. Overall, I'm cautiously hopeful with a strong emphasis on cautious. I sincerely hope we don't end up getting a lot of the worst elements of a compilation in however many parts we'll get. If I see Genesis again, I will shit in my hands and squeeze. But you know where I'd like to see him? The VR missions. Wearing a mask to avoid the impending lawsuit. Maybe give us VR missions where we can fight Kadaj, Loz, and Yazoo like they were in Advent Children. Maybe give us a Chamber of Remembrance style room where we fight VR missions of the Sviets. Something I'm dying to see them tackle is Vincent and Lucrezia's story. I'd be totally on board with Sephiroth finding out that this woman is his real mother and seeing how he handles it, be it with swift violence or something else entirely. And this is one of my biggest fan fiction, fan wank tier level suggestions, but I'd be too 200% down for seeing Hojo being the final boss of the entire remake. Give him a Kefka moment which elevates him to an almost godlike status. The man who orchestrated it all, and who, for me at least, has always felt like the biggest villain in Seven due to his actions and the consequences that arose from them. I don't know, I just think it'd be pretty neat, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, you're really gonna do him dirty? Just cut him off like that? Also, Rufus. Why the hell could he see the whispers? There is so much they can do with part two, and I'm excited, tantalized, nervous, and terrified to see what'll happen next. End of the day, we've got a long wait ahead of us. And as I said in my first video, I just want to have fun with this. You have no idea how much I just want to have fun with this. Thank you all so much for watching, and I hope to see you all in the next video. Oh boy, oh boy. I never planned for the video to be this long, but here we are. Not gonna lie, I'm excited to play this game for fun now and not talk about it ever again until part two comes out. First things first, I'd like to thank some patrons. Those being Durrani, Mogalicious, Jimron, and Arvid Kopp. 
thank you, as always, for your continued support. I'd also like to thank this lovely list of names as well. All of them helped out in some way with their vocal talent, so go check them out in the description. Finally, a massive, humongous thank you, as always, to Sylphie, who's really gone above and beyond here. The Aggrieve Suko sketch was originally broken down into assets which Sylphie drew for me, which I crudely animated to look the way it does. She's not only a fantastic artist who draws most of my thumbnails, but a very good friend. Go check her out, ask for a commission, and give her a follow. I'm about ready to take a 200 year long nap at this stage, so please, stay safe, and I'll see you all next time.